I've been going to Cuba for over a little over 40 years and always to deal with the people in the churches in Cuba. It was my 37th trip to Cuba. So this trip, like every other trip, was uh, educational, inspiring. It's very inspiring to see what they're doing there. And I have the privilege of having the perspective of looking at the church since almost the beginning of the revolution. And so I've seen how they've changed and how the government has changed toward them. And I found that very, very interesting. Having gone to Cuba for almost 40 years, I've been able to see Cuba from the earliest days of the revolution when Fidel Castro came to power. I think people forget often that uh, when Fidel came to power, he took power from uh, Batista, who was then in charge, who by all accounts and by almost everybody's recollection and uh, admission uh, was running a fairly criminal uh, country with uh, all kinds of activities going on that were illegal, uh, to say nothing of some rather immoral. Castro was highly welcomed by the people. They often tell the story, uh, both here and there, about the fact that when Castro and Che Guevara walked into Havana, that they rode in on horses without a single gun being fired. Uh, they had spent almost a year going through, the, through Cuba. They had begun health clinics. They began schools. They began talking to the people, treating the people, talking to the people about what their future might be. And so when they came in, Cuba was already theirs. And I think that's a picture of the revolution that we forget and we don't remember what a, a blessing it was seen to be by many, many of the Cuban people, certainly not by the people with uh, with great wealth, who most of whom left and came to uh, Miami. And so part of what we still deal with in this country is the anger and bitterness of those who left Cuba when Castro came in. They were definitely not the beneficiaries of Castro's coming to power. Uh, Castro made no bones about the fact that when he came to power, it was to help the lower classes and to raise them up. Uh, and so Cuba has faced for a very, very long time the anger and resentment of those who left. And many of them still live in Florida. They're an older generation now, some of them in their 80s. Uh, what's happening in Florida is that the older generation, though they have the power in the Cuban community and a great deal of the resources, they really are being uh, challenged by their grandchildren who would like to go back to Cuba and would like the relationships between Cuba and the United States to be more friendly. For those who don't know the history of Cuba, Cuba has lived under a blockade now for 48 years, which means they cannot trade with the United States. People from the United States are not free to travel to Cuba, nor to take money, nor to take medical supplies, or anything that Cuba needs unless they have a special permission from our government, and the permission comes from the Treasury Department. So what we have is um, a very, very difficult situation between Cuba and the United States that is now embedded in many, many years of U.S. policy. We've been through Democratic presidents, Republican presidents. Almost every one of them have managed to continue the blockade and uh, with very little change until fairly recently when the Bush administration has put in place some procedures that are much, much more difficult uh, for Americans to be part of Cuban life than it has been for a long time. The trip this time was sponsored by the uh, Episcopal Diocese of Washington. The license came from the Treasury Department for the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. Um, it's a little interesting, especially to take note of the fact this is the diocese that is in Washington, D.C. It is the place from which all the presidents are buried, if in fact they choose to be buried in Washington, D.C. Uh, John Chain serves as bishop of, uh, of that area and presides over all of these official government, uh, government events. And it's very interesting that even for the Diocese of Washington, it took them three years to get a license to travel to Cuba um, and we did not go on a license that would allow us to take money to Cuba or allow us to take anything other than ourselves. And it was a one-time license.
Uh, the restrictions on Americans being part of Cuban life are very, very difficult now. All of the mainline churches, with the exception of the Presbyterian Church, have now had their licenses taken away. And so the only church that remains with a license to travel freely to Cuba without um, restrictions is the Presbyterian Church. And I can't explain why this is, but they, they managed to have a fairly uh, liberal license to go to Cuba. What's happening now is that licenses are being given to congregations, particularly congregations in the United States that are more conservative, and they are being allowed to go to Cuba uh, at any time they want, and their licenses allow them to take money and uh, to take uh, goods and services down to Cuba. Life in Cuba, uh, I would say that Cuba is a poor country. They have, um, they have enough to have well-being. When you walk the streets of Cuba, you see people dancing and smiling and uh, enjoying life in the main. Uh, there's nobody that's terribly wealthy in Cuba. You don't see any evidences of great wealth. Uh, what you see are people who are well taken care of in the basic needs of life. All Cubans have free health care from the time uh, before they're born, actually. I mean, pregnant women have all the health care that they need to be sure they deliver a healthy baby. And um, until you die, you have free health care in Cuba. And it's excellent. I was a couple trips ago very sick in Cuba and uh, had to call a doctor. They took care of me in the hotel I was in came in, changed my bed every hour during the night. The doctor came, gave me a shot. I had an infection, and um, by the morning I was much better. And when I went in to pay for it, they said, no, you don't understand, this is Cuba. Uh, you don't need to pay for this. Cubans have enough to eat. Uh, they don't have an extravagant diet, but they have good, solid food. Cuba's a beautiful, beautiful country with you know, bananas hanging from the trees and uh, wonderful fruit that's grown there. In the seminary, they have just begun organic gardens that fed the whole city of Matanzas. So what you see in Cuba are people who are well fed, their health care is taken care of, and their education is completely taken care of. When children go through, they go completely through ninth grade, uh, all children, and then at ninth grade, they uh, evaluate them as to whether they will go on to college or beyond college to graduate school. All those expenses are borne by the government. So what you really have is a population that is probably, in our terms, would be almost a lower middle class population. Uh, they work in many different jobs. Cuba's doctors don't make a great deal more money than some of the other people do. So it's, um, it's a much more egalitarian society. If the embargo were lifted today, um, the, the way Cuba would benefit is that there are many things, they, they have many things that they own, cars, um, appliances, um, classic things, bowls, toilets. They're all from the United States. They can't get the replacement parts. And the most serious thing, of course, is that there's many, many medicines that are very, very expensive to them that for us would be, they're very, would be very inexpensive if they could get them from the United States. And I think one of their biggest reasons to want the embargo lifted is not only so they could trade, but I mean, there's things people have no idea. If you are flying from Canada to Cuba, you may not fly over United States space. So the Canadians have to go out to the Atlantic Ocean, down the Atlantic Ocean to Cuba, rather than coming from Toronto down to Cuba, which would be across American land. And I think people have no idea that the embargo doesn't just affect the Cubans. It affects our neighbors. If there is a bank, we ran into a student at the seminary who is Austrian. And his mother had been sending money to Cuba, which he was certainly allowed to do for his education in the seminary. The bank that she put her money in was bought by a U.S. bank, and now she is not allowed to send her son money because the U.S. bank that bought it says you may not send money to Cuba.
So it shows the way in which their life is constricted, not just restricted, but constricted by the existence of this blockade. Now, having said all that, I think the scary thing about the blockade, the very fact that there is a blockade means that there's very little U.S. influence in Cuba. And um, the, the kind of commercialism that might become part of Cuba is, is missing. I mean, just like they use old parts, they, they make things work, they grow their own food. Um, a lot of this might change. And the biggest concern are ideas.